I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today we continue with Section 5-2 of Coup d'etat by Edward Lutwak. 1. What is the coup d'etat? Quote, I shall be sorry to commence the era of peace by a coup d'etat such as that I had in contemplation. End quote. The Duke of Wellington, 1811. Quote, no other way of salvation remained except for the army's intervention. Close quote. Constantine Callias, 21st April, 1967, Athens. Though the term coup d'etat has been used for more than 300 years, the feasibility of the coup derives from a comparatively recent development the rise of the modern state with its professional bureaucracy and standing armed forces. The power of the modern state largely depends on this permanent machinery which, with its archives, files, records, and officials, can follow intimately and, if it so desires, control the activities of lesser organizations and individuals. Totalitarian states merely use more fully the detailed and comprehensive information which is available to most states, however democratic. The instrument is largely the same, though it is used differently. The growth of the modern bureaucracy has two implications which are crucial to the feasibility of the coup. The development of a clear distinction between the permanent machinery of state and the political leadership, and the fact that, like most large organizations, the bureaucracy has a structured hierarchy with definite chains of command. The distinction between the bureaucrat as an employee of the state and as a personal servant of the ruler is a new one, and both the British and American systems show residual features of the earlier structure. The importance of this development lies in the fact that if the bureaucrats are linked to the leadership, an illegal seizure of power must take the form of a palace revolution, and it essentially concerns the manipulation of the person of the ruler. He can be forced to accept new policies or advisors, he can be killed or held captive, but whatever happens, the palace revolution can only be conducted from the inside by insiders. The insiders can be the palace guard as in ancient Rome or the Ethiopia of the 1960s. And in a dynastic system, they would seek to replace an unwanted ruler with a more malleable son. The coup is much more democratic affair. It can be conducted from the outside, and it operates in that area, outside the government, but within the state which is formed by the permanent and professional civil service, the armed forces and police. The aim is to detach the permanent employees of the state from the political leadership, and this cannot usually take place if the two are linked by political, ethnic, or traditional loyalties. Both Imperial China and present-day African states use ethnic bonds as the organization of their senior bureaucracy. The Manchu dynasty was careful to follow native Chinese customs and to employ Han Chinese in the civil service at all levels, but the crucial posts in the magistracy and the army were filled by the descendants of those who entered China with the founders of the dynasty. Similarly, African rulers usually appoint members of their own tribes to the strategic posts in the security services. When a party machine controls civil service appointments, either as part of a general totalitarian control or because of a very long period in office, as in post-war Italy. Political associates are appointed to the senior levels of the bureaucracy, partly in order to protect the regime and partly to ensure the sympathetic execution of policies. Thus, party men hold the key jobs in the police and security services of France and Italy, just as the communist countries' all senior jobs are held by party apparatchiks. Saudi Arabia provides an instance of traditional bonds. In this case, the lack of modern know-how on the part of the traditional tribal affiliates of the royal house has meant that what could not be done individually has been done organizationally. Alongside the modern army staffed by unreliable city dwellers, there is the white army of the Wahhabi Bedouin followers of the Saudis. Such possible bonds between political leadership and the bureaucracy are not typical of the modern state. Apart from the cases noted above, the civil service and the leadership of the modern state may still be linked by class or ethnic affiliations. But whatever the nature of the bonds, such groupings will usually be large enough to be infiltrated by the planners of the coup. As a direct consequence of the sheer size of the bureaucracy, and in order to achieve even a minimum of efficiency, the state bureaucracy has to divide its work into clear-cut areas of competence, which are assigned to different departments. Within each department, there must be an accepted chain of command, and standard procedures have to be followed. Thus, a given piece of information or a given order is followed up in a stereotyped manner. 
and if the order comes from the appropriate source at the appropriate level, it is carried out. In the more critical parts of the state apparatus, the armed forces, the police, and the security services. All these characteristics are intensified with an even greater degree of discipline and rigidity. The apparatus of the state is therefore to some extent a machine, which will normally behave in a fairly predictable and automatic manner. A coup operates by taking advantage of this machine-like behavior. During the coup, because it uses parts of the state apparatus to seize the controlling levers, afterwards because the value of the levers depends on the fact that the state is a machine. We will see that some states are so well organized that the machine is sufficiently sophisticated to exercise discretion, according to a given conception of what is proper and what is not, in the orders that it executes. This is the case in some developed countries, and in such circumstances a coup is very difficult to carry out. In a few states, the bureaucracy is so small that the apparatus is too simple and too intimately linked with the leadership to be suitable for a coup, as perhaps in the ex-British protectorates in southern Africa, Botswana, Lesotho, and Swaziland. Fortunately, most states are between these two extremes, the machine being both large and unsophisticated, and thus highly vulnerable to those who can identify and seize the right levers. One of the most striking developments of the last century has been the great decline in general political stability. Since the French Revolution, governments have been overthrown at an increasing pace. In the 19th century, the French experienced two revolutions and two regimes collapsed following military defeat. In 1958, the change of regime was a sophisticated blend of both these elements. People everywhere have followed the French example, and the lifespan of regimes has tended to decrease while the lifespan of their subjects has increased. This contrasts sharply with the relative attachment to the system of constitutional monarchy which was displayed in the 19th century. When Greeks, Bulgars, and Romanians secured their freedom from the Turkish colonial system, they immediately went over to Germany in order to shop around for a more suitable royal family. Crowns, flags, and decorations were designed and purchased from reputable suppliers. Royal palaces were built, and where possible, hunting lodges, royal mistresses, and a local aristocracy were provided as fringe benefits. 20th century people have, on the other hand, showed a marked lack of interest in monarchies and their paraphernalia. When the British kindly provided them with a proper royal family, the Iraqis made numerous efforts to get rid of it before finally succeeding in 1958. Military and other right-wing forces have meanwhile tried to keep up with popular movements and have used their illegal methods in order to seize power and overthrow regimes. Why have regimes in the 20th century proved so fragile? It is, after all, paradoxical that this fragility has increased while the established procedures for securing changes in government have on the whole become more flexible. The political scientists will reply that though the procedures have become more flexible, pressures for change have also become stronger, and that the rate of increase in flexibility has not kept up with the growth of social and economic pressures. Violent methods are generally used when legal methods of securing a government change are useless, because they are either too rigid, as in the case of ruling monarchies where the ruler actually controls policy formation, or not rigid enough. It was once remarked, for example, that the throne of Russia was, until the 17th century, neither hereditary nor elective, but occupative. The long series of abdications forced by the great boyar landlords and by the archers of the guard had weakened the hereditary principle, so that whoever took the throne became czar, and precedence by birth counted for little. Some contemporary republics have ended in this position, which comes about when a long series of illegal seizures of power leads to a decay of the legal and political structures which are needed to produce new governments. Thus, post-war Syria has had more than a dozen coups, and the provisions for open general elections, written in the Horani constitution, could not now be applied because the necessary supervisory machinery no longer functions. Assuming, however, that there is an established procedure for changing the leadership, then all methods other than this come within the range of illegality. What we call them depends on what side we are on, but skipping some of the semantics, we have the following. Revolution. The action is conducted, initially at any rate, by uncoordinated popular masses, and it aims at changing the social and political structures, as well as the actual personalities in the leadership. The term has gained a certain popularity, and many coups are grace with it, because of the implication that it was the people rather than a few plotters who did the whole thing. Thus, the obscure aims which Qasim had in mind when he overthrew the Faisal Nuri as Said regime in Iraq are locally known as the sacred principles of the July 14th Revolution. Civil War 
Civil war is actual warfare between elements of the national armed forces leading to the displacement of a government. This term is unfashionable, and if you are Spanish and pro-Franco, you call the events 1936-9 La Cruzada, the Crusade. If you are not pro-Franco, but you may be overheard, you just call them the events of. Pronunciamiento. This is essentially Spanish and South American version of the military coup d'etat. But many recent African coups have also taken this particular form. In its original 19th century Spanish version, this was a highly ritualized process. First came the trabajos, literally the works, in which the opinions of army officers were sounded. The next step was the compromisos, in which commitments were made and rewards promised. Then came the call for action, and finally, the appeal to the troops to follow their officers in rebellion against the government. The pronunciamiento was often a liberal rather than a reactionary phenomenon, and the theoretical purpose of the takeover was to ascertain the, quote, national will, a typically liberal concept. Later, as the army became increasingly right-wing, while Spanish governments became less so, the theory shifted from neoliberal national will to the neoconservative real will theory. This postulates the existence of a national essence, a sort of permanent spiritual structure, which the wishes of the majority may not always express. The army was entrusted with the interpretation and preservation of this, quote, essential Spain, and to protect it against the government and, if need be, against the people. The pronunciamiento was organized and led by a particular army leader, but it was carried out in the name of the entire officer corps. Unlike the pooch, which is carried out by a faction within the army, or the coup, which can be carried out by civilians using some army units, the pronunciamiento leads to a takeover by the army as a whole. Many African takeovers in which the army has participated as a whole were therefore very similar to the classic pronunciamiento. Pooch. Essentially a wartime or immediately post-war phenomenon, a pooch is attempted by a formal body within the armed forces under its appointed leadership. The Kornilov Putsch is a clear example. Kornilov, a general in charge of an army group in North Russia, attempted to seize Leningrad in order to establish a, quote, fighting regime which would prosecute the war. Had he succeeded, the city would perhaps bear his name instead of Lenin's. Liberation. A state may be said, by supporters of the change, to be liberated when its government is overthrown by foreign military or diplomatic intervention. A classic case was the installation of the communist leadership in Romania in 1947. The USSR forced the then King Michael to accept a new cabinet by threatening to use the Soviet army in the country in the event of a refusal. War of national liberation, insurgency, etc. In this form of internal conflict, the aim of the initiating party is not to seize power within the state, but rather to set up a rival state structure. This can be politically or ethnically based. The Viet Cong and South of Vietnam aim at setting up a new social structure and incidentally a new state. The Kurds in Iraq, the Somalis in Kenya, the Karens in Burma, and the Nagas in India want to withdraw their areas from the state concern. The Definition of the Coup A coup d'etat involves some elements of all these different methods by which power can be seized, but, unlike most of them, the coup is not necessarily assisted by either the intervention of the masses or to any significant degree by military-type force. The assistance of these forms of direct force would no doubt make it easier to seize power, but it would be unrealistic to think that they would be available to the organizers of a coup. Because we will not be in charge of the armed forces, we cannot hope to start the planning of a coup with sizable military units already under our control. Nor will the pre-coup government usually allow us to carry out the propaganda and organization necessary to make effective use of the broad masses of the people. A second distinguishing feature of a coup is that it does not imply any particular political orientation. Revolutions are usually, quote, leftist, while the pooch and the pronunciamiento are usually initiated by right-wing forces. A coup, however, is politically neutral, and there is no presumption that any particular policies will be followed after the seizure of power. It's true that many coups have been of a decidedly right-wing character, but there's nothing inevitable about this. If a coup does not make use of the masses or of warfare, what instrument of power will enable it to seize control of the state? The short answer is that the power will come from the state itself. The long answer makes up the bulk of this book. The following is our formal and functional definition. A coup consists of the infiltration of a small but critical segment of the state apparatus, which is then used to displace the government from its control of the remainder. Thus concludes section 5.2. What is the coup d'etat? 
from Coup d'etat by Edward Loewak. Tomorrow we will continue with section 5.3. 2. When is a coup d'etat possible? I will see you then. Alam.